Thank you very much. Good day, folks. Thank you very much for, for joining us from wherever you are in the world. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night. Um, thank you for coming along to this conversation, to this talk, talking about leading with agility in the, in the 21st century. We're coming up to 2021. The, lead, the need for leadership is incredibly important today. And we want to explore what leadership looks like with an agile mindset in an agile organization. But before we do that, I'd like to hear from you. So if you would use the Mentimeter poll, so please go to menti.com on any device and key in the code that is on the screen there, 8187636. And I will pop up the, uh, where is the window? menti.com 81876336 and please type in what comes to mind what do you think when you when you hear this term leadership agility and we're going to generate a a word cloud change Servant leadership, lead by example, truth. Mm. Enabling people, leading the way. Culture. Servant leadership coming up strong. Lead by example, leading the way. Mindset. Support, support the innovation culture. Responsibility. Transparency. Motivation, enabling people. Agile mindset, proactive. Localized decision making, right work at right time. Anticipate change. Work together as a team. Collaboration, responsibility. Change agent awareness. Holistic delivery, Ooh, some lovely terms in here. Okay, I'll leave that running in the background. So as we, as you're thinking about stuff, just feel free to add things. But we're we're going in the in the direction that that I'm hoping to bring to bring to you today. So first of all, let's talk a little bit just to give you a a, a structure for our session. We've got. 35 to 45 minutes altogether, leadership agility. We start with what, a, what do we mean by that? Then delving into the three aspects that uh, in IC Agile we looked at in terms of what does it mean to be an Agile leader today? And it was know yourself, develop others, 
and inspire transformation. So business agility is the buzzword of this decade. Organizations have acknowledged whether they like it or not, that they have to be able to rapidly respond to change. And agility, that ability to respond to change in a turbulent environment in order to not just cope, but to thrive and to, and to, be, a, to be successful in that turbulent environment. It's crucial as a, a, an organization set of muscles today. And in the, the domains of business agility that the Business Agility Institute has come up with, they've looked at these, these three broad areas. And the one we're gonna talk about tonight or today is the, is the concept of leadership. What is in that leadership area? And what, is, what does it mean to be an agile leader. So first of all, let's talk about leadership in and of itself. Leadership is something that we hope will emerge at every level in the organization. In fact, we talk about leadership as le at every level as being one of the characteristics of effectively agile organizations in this post-COVID, well, midst of COVID, but uh, chaotic era, era today. It's got associated capabilities and techniques, but everyone can be a leader. And it's the capacity to step up into leadership as is needed. Irrespective of what your job title, what, it, what your um, positional authority might be, your positional, your power in whatever hierarchy you sit in. Leadership is that ability to know when you need to step into the here, uh, whether it's offering suggestions, whether it's making decisions, whether it's giving advice, whether it's bringing others along on a journey. It's not waiting to be told it's aligning with organization goals and outcomes and working at actively towards that. And it starts with personal agility. You need as an agile leader, as somebody aspiring to leadership in this context, to be able to hold the mirror up and look at yourself, to be honest, to self-assess, self-awareness, self-management, to acknowledge your own flaws, your own areas of, of potential growth, to bring a growth mindset, the, the perspective of if, if there is a challenge, it's not, I can't do it. It's, I can't do it yet. I still need to learn, but I think I can figure this out. Or I know where to go to get the help to figure this out. It's knowing your personal purpose and values. It's knowing the, your own lines in the sand the things that matter to you, what is driving you? What is your ikigai, to use a, a, a phrase, that, a term that's become com, uh, popular lately. Alistair Coburn spoke a lot about ikigai, the, what is right at the core of your being. It's about understanding your own mental models. What are my biases? What are the things that have influenced me that may be holding me back or preventing me? And it's really, really understanding at your core the values of agility. Um, whether we take the Agile Manifesto as a starting point, but it's that philosophy of 
people over process, customer centricity, value delivery that drives everything that I do in my work in the organization. And then I look at the bigger aspects of value. They drive everything that I do in my life. And it's tools like the Jahari window, where I can consciously say, okay, this is, this, this is what I know, known to me, known to other, known to the world. Where are my blind spots? Where are the things that I don't know and nobody else knows? And the goal, and this is a mindfulness practice, is to steadily enlarge that open and free area, make that top quadrant bigger and bigger, a larger proportion what is known to you, what is known to, to, to other, what is visible to the world. This is who I am. There is no uh, obfuscation. What you see is what you get. And I'm deliberately and consciously working to uncover my blind areas and to be transparent and to shrink the hidden and the unknown. And when I'm doing this in the context of working in an organization, it's a wonderful way of building trust with the people around me, with my colleagues, with my peers. And leadership requires trust. Leadership inspires followers. We don't follow people that we don't trust. So this ability, the, the deliberate conscious work on becoming more transparent, more visible, more open. This, and I do not expect you to <laughs> read this diagram, but this is a, a, a Wikipedia article, in fact. The Cognitive Bias Codex, published in 2016, there are 60 something in fact i know it's more than that i'm not going to count them <laughs> it's around the hundred mark recognized biases that we bring with us and we're never going to get rid of them but the more awareness that we can have of the biases that we carry from from our childhood from our experience from our interaction this again that mindful look at myself what are my triggers what are the things where i respond emotively instead of thoughtfully look for those areas and what can I do to moderate, to, to self-manage, that self-management aspect? Really important, really powerful, really valuable in, in building the, the, the trust that is so important to leadership and also to the self-management that is needed to be that leader. It's also important to understand my own leadership style. What is my natural approach? Uh, am I the affiliate? Am I democratic? Am I a coach? Am I authoritative in a supportive and positive way? Am I being coercive? Am I creating tension through the pace setting approach? What is my natural style, my default style? And then what is the style that the people that I'm asking to follow me 
on this journey need from me? And we are looking, there's a bias here towards the ones in green, the ones that the leadership styles that promote harmony, harmony and positive outcomes. There's a correlation between those leadership styles and organizational adaptation and adaptiveness and, and agility. Agile organizations need harmonious, supportive leadership. That doesn't mean that we can't disagree. In fact, in agile organizations, we can disagree a lot, but we disagree about the topic without de denigrating the person. And the, the authoritative leadership style is, is sometimes a very necessary and very valuable one taken with that come with me stance as, approach, as opposed to the do what I tell you to stance. I'm bringing you with me on a journey as a leader. Another important aspect is the concept of ethics and values. What standards do you hold yourself to? And how visible is that to others? Um, Johanna Rothman talks about organizational culture as the lowest common denominator of the behaviors that leaders allow to go unchallenged. So when I see behaviors that are unethical, behaviors that are uh, not positive and supportive, I don't idly sit by and say, that's not my problem. I actively step into and challenge and bring the, what is the right way? But to do that, I have to very much know for myself and of myself, what are my guides, my guiding principles, my values and ethics. And I need to explore that. I need to be able to articulate it. I need to be able to, to render this to others. So those are some of the ideas about know yourself in order to become the leader that people would be prepared to follow. And that's the key thing. Leadership happens because other people follow us and they choose to follow us. The next aspect is the leader looking to grow others. So as an individual contributor, success was often about growing yourself. When you do become a leader at any level, success becomes growing others, bringing other people along. And what do you need to do to bring other people on that journey? And we talk about the concept of relationship agility. What is the impact that you have on others? What is other people's behavior impact on you? How do I look at the, the organization as a human system? How do I create the interactions with the people around me that free up the potential of us as this human system? The serendipitous, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. And we see this in, in teams and teams that become effective and, and collaborative and cross-functional and high-performing. Where are our stories? As a leader, I need to have the compelling stories, the ability to convey the why 
of what we are doing in in a way that the people that I'm trying to to bring on this journey with me can not only grasp and see it, but can truly engage with it. It's being open and honest about my own emotional aspect as well. We, we can talk about emotional agility, the ability to have the full range of emotions and experiences, including the more difficult ones, when things get tough and still choose to act in ways that are aligned with our values and that are supportive of people. So that emotional self-management, one, one of the key areas of emotional intelligence. As a leader, my reaction in response to my own emotional behaviors, my own, own emotional responses, and my responses to other people's emotional reactions have the biggest impact on the people around, around me. So if I can keep calm when the world is chaotic, if I can carry people on this journey with me, even though it's hard, and this beautiful quote, people will, will forget what you said, they will forget what you did, but they will never forget how you made them feel. How do we make sure that we carry that we made them feel strong, positive, empowered, enabled in order to create that environment of success. So as a leader in this developing others, I'm deliberately, consciously, constantly managing my own responses in order to ensure that how I make people feel is motivated and inspired. And again, this doesn't mean we can't have the hard conversations and that things must always be bed of roses, no. But when I am having a, a hard conversation, the, the people I'm talking to know that it is coming from a place of genuine caring. There is trust that this is about finding opportunities to improve, to do better, to achieve better outcomes for our customers, for our organizations, for our, for our people, for our society, for our planet. And bringing that, that positivity, even in the face of challenging interactions. And a tool such as appreciative inquiry. It's a strength-based positive approach. We know from all sorts of um, research into self-development that we get better outcomes and organizational development. We get better outcomes when we reinforce and build on the positive rather than to trying trying to change the things that we're not so great at so how do we create environments where we can discover and design new ways forward together and the concept of of, of appreciative acquiry a positive dialogue moving forward to achieving win-win-win situations. The world is not a win-lose. Life is not win-lose. Our, our organizations are not win-lose. How do we create this win-win-win mentality all around? An appreciative inquiry, if you haven't come across it, I would encourage you to go and explore and as an approach to leadership development and organizational change. 
another really important thing we need to, to look at is what are the metaphors that we use in our, in, our, in our speech? How do we think about our organization? 20th century management, 20th century businesses took the machine metaphor to the extreme. And we still see some organizations that are run and we will, we'll, you might hear the term, it runs like a well-oiled machine. The challenge is that in a machine, if something breaks, you just pluck it out and you, you replace it with an identical unit. Well, we're not in the machine era. We're in the human era. And the better metaphor today, and the better way to think as a leader in our organizations is the garden. In the garden, we nurture, we create this, we, we, we fertilize the soil, we put the compost down, we plant the plant, we water it, we care for it. The plant grows and we get the benefit from it. We create an ecosystem that enables growth. If the plant is not doing well, we don't take it out and throw it away and, and plant another one. No, we feed it, we water it. We put insecticide or today we'll use uh, <clears throat> a non-herbicidal, non uh, we'll do companion planting. We'll, we'll nurture the whole environment because we know that when the garden thrives, we thrive. Well, how do we create that? And how do I stop thinking of my, my team, my organization in terms of the, the machine and think of it as the garden and I'm the gardener? My responsibility is to, to care for the environment and then the plants will grow effectively. I can't make the plant grow. All I can do is put the, so the right soil in place, the right nutrients, the right, right amount of water at the, right, at the right time. How do I do that in my organization? How do I do that with my people? How do I become, to, to quote Pierre Maria Torin, the, the organizational garden? How do I elevate people? This is the um, moving motivators cards from management 3.0 and if you haven't come across this as a tool i would encourage you to go and find about find out about it how do we overcome the friction in our our organizational experience that means i have to understand what are the things that matter to my people and then nurture the garden so that they achieve what works for them? Do we have the right technology in place? Do we have the right environment? Now, there should be nothing that prevents somebody in the organization doing the best possible job that they can. As a leader, my role, my responsibility is to supply the environment. And this can be as simple as making sure that somebody working at home has both a laptop and an external monitor because there's more space and they, that reduces the friction in their work. down to how do I ensure that the my people have got access to the right training, to the, the right 
support? What if somebody's struggling with homeschooling their children while trying to work? Well, what can we do to support them, to enable that, to remove that friction, to elevate people, not delegate? If we elevate, if we elevate people, they, we don't need to then delegate. They will take the ownership and, and responsibility and accountability. And that's what we want. We want to enable that leadership to emerge through elevation. Delegation is not, doesn't result in leadership. It's not empowering. But if I elevate somebody and they take the opportunity, they take the ownership, then that, that empowerment is so important. And we're a storytelling species. What are the, the powerful stories that you can bring to your conversations with your colleagues? The story where somebody had a significant, significant impact on your life. The story where you made a major mistake. And what did you learn from that? The story where you were proud to be part of this organization because what what they are doing and what you are doing makes a difference in the world the story of when you learn something about yourself how do you bring these stories to inspire your people and recognize that we are a storytelling species. That's what sets us apart. Have a, a, a well, have a, a catalog of your own stories that you're able to share and look for other people's stories. Listen to other people's stories and create environments where they can have great stories. And the third part of leadership with an agile mindset, leadership agility, is inspiring transformational change. People don't resist change, they resist being changed. So it's not about the, the, the control, change management is a misnomer. It should not be about change management. You inspire people and they then be, they, they take on that change. The Gandhi quote, you must be the change you want to see in the world. Imagine that future, tell the story of the future state and then live that future. And this image comes from some time I spent with an organization who's got this right. And I would encourage you to read this book if you haven't come across it before. Richard Sheridan, Chief Joy Officer. How great leaders elevate human energy and eliminate fear. Now, Richard founded the, his company, Menlo Innovations. They're a software development shop. Uh, they build software products for other people. And they work in the, um, a lot of what the work they're doing is in the high tech, um, high risk space. So medical device control systems, uh, those sorts of things. So um, highly legislated, highly um, compliance driven environment. But when they founded the organization, he and, and his co-founder, James Noble, they deliberately said what we want we believe that there is a business value in a culture of joy. And they worked to deliberately create that environment where people feel the joy of a job well done. The fulfillment of doing great work in an environment where 
you are able to be at your best. So leadership agility, understanding yourself, developing others. There is some people management aspects, absolutely. Creating the environment where people can be most successful. Creating a culture of one team and the strategic ability to adapt and respond. But I also want to ask you, what does it mean to be an agile nation? And there's an amazing TED talk that I would point you to. It's by Rashina Hoda. And it, the, the lady in the picture here is Jacinda Ardern. She's the prime minister of New Zealand. Um, and after the terrorist attacks in Christchurch, New Zealand responded in a way, and she led us in responding in a way that was completely different to what you, you, you've seen in many other countries. And Rashina, in her TED talk, looked at the, the way that this society had responded in response to that and led by this lady. And she equated it to the four values of the Ad Agile Manifesto. And she came up with the four values of an Agile society. And these four values, people, inter people and interactions over protocols and rules, community collaboration over closed decision-making, policies and actions over speeches and promises, and responding to change over following the status quo. And we saw that in action and through the, the last eight months with the, the COVID crisis, New Zealand's done pretty well. And I can point to these four values in action. And it's because we have been led with agility. So to me, there is, there are things that an agile nation but this requires new ways of thinking and acting. This is not easy. These are hard changes that start with a change internally and go on to uh, working with others. So I would ask you to, what are the changes that you are prepared to make? And I will do a little bit of an advert. I see Agile, we do have certifications courses that teach some of these skills but becoming competent requires the develop the self-development and the courage to do it so thank you very much and are there any questions?